Good evening, and thank you for joining the NOFA Summer Conference. I hope that you've enjoyed the workshops, dance parties, and happy hours so far, and there's a whole lot more to come. Tonight's workshop will be Glyphosate, the Killer Chemical That Must Be Stopped by Dr. Stephen Franz. It, this will be an interactive workshop with uh, a Q&A session following. And as uh, Dr. Franz said at the beginning, if you have any pressing questions that are hindering your following of, uh, of what is happening at the moment, make sure to ask them. Um, you can do so by clicking on the chat, which is a little button towards the bottom of the screen. I will be monitoring the chat and putting up links there. The summer conference is brought to you by these sponsors. We have some wonderful people really working hard to bring this, uh, all this programming to you. Um, you can see the people here. We have uh, a couple of slides that I'm going to go through of the sponsors. I don't have a whole lot more to say, but I'll try to linger shortly upon each one. We are presenting, attending, and hosting this workshop from land that was managed and inhabited before European colonization. We have this map here which shows the indigenous uh, land and you can see where we are, uh, where we are presenting this from. Um, I'm in Petersam, which is a small town on the northeast side of the Quabbin in the center of Massachusetts. And Dr. Franz is in South Hadley, um, a slightly west of, of me. That is, right in the Pakumtuk land, I would cool. say. And, yep, okay. And with that said, enjoy the workshop. I'm going to sit back and turn things over to Dr. Franz and uh, thank you. I wanted to start off by saying, you know, that glyphosate by itself is a horrific product. I mean, it really should never have been released in the environment. And, I will discuss the basics of glyphosate, but I'm also going to be bringing in, I'm, I'm using it basically as a poster child of how many other horrific chemicals there are out here that have to be controlled. And I should mention, I, I'm, I'm fairly recent transplant here from Los Angeles, so a lot of my California, I, I worked on glyphosate a long time there before I came here, so um, there'll be references to that, but it's just part of the process. So glyphosate is the primary ingredient, really the primary active ingredient in, in Roundup and a whole bunch of other uh, herbicides. We'll show that later. This is the molecule for, for glyphosate. Um, and then um, it's really just kind of a complicated glycine molecule. It's like the one on the left you're seeing here is, is glyphosate, the one on the right is glycine. And they just added basically uh, a few atoms to it and made a billion dollar difference is what I can say. Oops. Okay, I'm stuck. How come? Let me see. I think I can get out of this. There you go. So, there are basically three patents for glyphosate. It was originally patented by Stoffer Chemical back in 1964, I think. Actually, I have my notes over here. Um, to remove minerals and scale and, you know, like magnesium, manganese, calcium, and so on from boilers and steam pipes. So, well, this is not working. I don't know why. I have another way of doing it over here, so. What that results in, and I have other information about how glyphosate has an effect on our lives, but this just shows you um, the brown part of the, of the uh, chart shows with glyphosate and the green part is without glyphosate. And so the amount of root uptake and translocation of minerals is diminished when plants are treated with glyphosate. This is, in, this is a, a paper, I just got this a few days ago from uh, Doug DeCandia when he was giving a lecture. Um, this shows basically the influence of, of uh, industrial farming, um, including 
well, the industrial farming, then the use of the fertilizer and the use of the pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, so a whole bunch of them and how they influence the availability of minerals. And you see over in the far right is what happens with GMOs and glyphosate and how that really dropped it down to the bottom. There'll be more on this. And as the minerals are reduced, the diseases go up. And I don't need to get into this, but it just shows over time here, the rate, in, the rate of increase from 1980 to 2011, the rate increase of heart conditions and so on. And, and granted, these are correlations, so it doesn't mean it's definite straight out cause and effect, but they're correlations. And if you have strong correlations, and you don't pay attention, you're probably an idiot. So um, this slide I like because it just shows the balance. Like if you have too much manganese and too little iron, then that favors autism and Alzheimer's. And if you have the reverse, too much iron and less manganese, and you have ADHD and Parkinson's. And so it's always this delicate balance of what's going on in your body. So um, that's the importance of all this mineral uh, influence. Second patent, the herbicide, uh, 1974. Uh, this is Monsanto's discovery, basically. Um, and there's a, the big issue with glyphosate disrupting shikimate, the shik, well, I always say the shikimate, but shikimate pathway. The shikimate pathway is not present in mammals per se, it's in plants, and it's in all the microbes in our gut. So when, when Monsanto, they've always, they've always said, well, it, glyphosate's harmless to people because it doesn't affect the shikimate pathway. In actual fact, it desperately affects the shikimate pathways. You just saw how it influences mineral uptake, mineral balance, and so on. I wish I could, maybe I can get this thing to work again. But anyway, so there are a lot of ingredients in glyphosate. And in fact, glyphosate made into the actual herbicide product is more toxic than glyphosate by itself. Glyphosate by itself is toxic, but it, it, it's accelerated when you add the, the surfactants and the penetrants and all that stuff. It's kind of logical it would do that. Oh, my, I, I've lost control of this bloody computer. So let's see. So I have to go here and go here. So it's a broad spectrum herbicide. It'll kill almost any plant. They have products for agriculture, forestry, aquatic weed control everywhere. Um, in fact, I've stopped aquatic weed control in here. In, I'm in South Hadley, Massachusetts. And I stopped some aquatic weed control by a golf course, but in some other stuff. But um, it is the most widely, herbicide, widely used herbicide in the world. And its residues are found everywhere. And we'll, we'll, we'll get into that. I said glyphosate has many names. It's all the same bloody poison, but it's got more names than you can shake stick out. There's probably over 800 products. So this was the first billion dollar pesticide. So if you wonder why Monsanto and now Bayer, which, which bought Monsanto, are so uh, hanging on to it, it's because it's worth a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of money. Um, I think more than 300 million pounds of glyphosate being used annually on a billion acres of crops is really frightening. And globally, uh, nine ag use, as you can see here, 1.8 billion pounds. I mean, 300, more than 300 million in the U.S. alone, and then 1.8 billion internationally. And they're expecting by 2024 to just be worth $11 billion. I think that's in question right now, but I'm probably wrong. Let's see, how do I find the slide? The third patent in 2010 was a, is an antimicrobial, basically an antibiotic. And the, for some specific uses, but the, the interest, since you know how widely used it is, this slide becomes important. It's very important in terms of antibiotic resistance. This slide just to show how antibiotic resistance occurs. You know, you get uh, one microbe resistant, and then first thing you know more, and then first thing you know, uh, a blowout of antibiotic resistance. In terms of the United States, this is a big deal. Uh, I mean, it comes from Medicare over, medical overuse, agriculture use, as we're talking about, and on crops. Um, 
And the result, we have 2.8 million people affected annually with antibiotic resistant organisms, representing 35,000 deaths annually. It's a pretty good chunk. So this is again, just review the four, the four, uh, let's see, the four patents, uh, three patents. And it's beyond that. I mean, the, more than killing weeds and those other things. I mean, in 1974, yeah, we had weed killing. In 1996, they developed glyphosate tolerant crops. These are, these are genetic modified crops so that you can spray them with glyphosate. It kills the weeds, but doesn't kill the crop. And then they added to that in 1999, they started using it as a drying agent. So like if, if the fields are, are damp and, or it's gonna rain and you need to harvest, you can rush up the drying by spraying with glyphosate. It kills the plant. But in the process of killing the plant, glyphosate concentration, you know, like it's, it's on grains primarily, but glyphosate concentration in those grains is high. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Wait, I just lost my navigator here. Wait, maybe I got it back. Oh, it's back. So these are the crops that, uh, the genetically modified crops um, that glyphosate is used on. These are all Roundup Ready crops. You can spray them. Started off with soybeans, and that includes all these other crops. And wheat, they're, they're pushing like hell to develop wheat. It hasn't been widely acceptable to people, uh, but They've used it in the field, it's leaked in the fields, it's contaminated fields, it's a problem. And the, the, the little numbers just reflect to what the usage is for those different uh, products. So, so, like I say, it's on, you can use this pre-harvest desiccant on non-GMO crops, um, and all these crops are, are non-GMO, um, or non GM crops. Uh, and I mentioned this before you kill it so you get a quicker harvest. And people have to realize, and some people don't, they, that glyphosate is a systemic. It cannot be washed out prior to use. It's in every, it's in every cell of that plant. And, uh, and because of that, you know, animals that eat uh, glyphosate. Uh, treated products, it ends up in the milk, the eggs, the cheese, the meat, whatever. It, whatever animals eat it, it ends up in whatever product comes out of that animal. This is just one slide to show the, the rapid growth of the use of, of uh, glyphosate in Roundup Ready crops. This is Roundup Ready corn, soy, and cotton, but you can see uh, the rapid expansion of its use over time. And I think the important point is that um, I'm just going to say I had a note here. The EPA now, for example, right now, compared to 1996, the EPA allows 50 times more glyphosate residue in corn than previously. And what happens, they keep adjusting what's, uh, I may talk about this later, I have a slide, but you know, they have what they say are the safe levels, which there are no safe levels for glyphosate, but for all pesticides, they have what they call safe level. And they keep adjusting it because they, they can't find a control with a lower level. So they have to raise what they consider the acceptable level. It's really insane. It's, it's not based on science, it's, uh, it's based on convenience. Oops. Yeah, lost it again. Just a minute. So I am. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, we know it's all, we know it's out there. We know there's a lot of it. Let's talk about exposure. So here, let me count the ways. Ah. It's frustrating. So, you know, people spray it in the backyards, and I'm always amazed at this. There's no protection. I've seen people spraying it barefooted, thong, you know, uh, shower thongs like in the backyard, they're spraying it. Of course, they spray it along the sides of streets and then it's sprayed on food. It's sprayed over trees. It, harm, it does harm forests, by the way. A lot of it's used in forests. Uh, 
uh, this shows another way you be because you have drift. I mean, it's not just the spray, direct spray on the product. So you have drift so that if you don't want to be sprayed, well, you may be anyway. I mean, like you can get um, a few hundred feet drift from a backpack sprayer and at least half a mile or more from aerial spraying, depending on the wind and other conditions. So this is how conventional and organic foods get contaminated. And um, well, you probably know there's a lot of history associated with that and the uh, deeds Monsanto has done to destroy farms, farming. Uh, herbicides move about, you know, it's like, um, I keep running these people who want to use it for, um, uh, what are they, um, invasive species. Oh my God, it's just drives me crazy. As if you spray it on that plant, it stays right there. Just gives you an idea, you have evapotranspiration. Um, so it's moving, in runoff to go to groundwater and streams and so on. It's evapotranspiration. You end up, it ends up in rain, so it comes back to us. I mean, in the Midwest, where a lot of glyphosate used, it comes back in rain. I don't know about here. Um, this shows, uh, this is back in, let's see, 2014. Uh, Two million kilograms or 4.4 million pounds of glyphosate were applied statewide in Mississippi. And 75% of the air in the rain samples tested positive for it. AMP is, a, is a, one of the adjuvants for glyphosate. So, uh, I'll try to go through this fast. I mean, um, I guess considering the many modes of how glyphosate is applied, um, treated, plants are treated, whatever, what's being done to protect the public. I mean, this is a big concern. So theoretically, the USDA has this really massive database to protect us all. The emphasis on commodities are consumed by infants and children. And it also to help the EPA how to assess dietary exposure and all that. I mean, it's supposed to be providing guidance to the FDA. The little difficulty with that is that glyphosate's excluded. <laughs> This absolutely horrible, massively used product is excluded. Uh, and in 2014, the U.S., uh, the uh, GA, uh, the Government Accounting Office, rebuked the USDA for this omission. So then they, they were going to do it, they're going to do it, and Trump came in and they didn't do it. And then 2017, they finally began a what they call their streamlined testing method for glyphosate. But like on eggs and milk, which would normally have it, they found nothing. And... Um, those results are highly questionable because in order to do that, um, the foods that cows and chickens eat would normally be contaminated with, with glyphosate treated grains and products. Glyphosate binds to fat and proteins and carbohydrates and you have to separate it from the substrate before you do the testing. If you don't do that substrate testing, you're not gonna find it. And we think that's what probably they did. So their streamlined method is just, um, Poor, let's put it that way, a mean kind. If you want to see, I haven't looked this up for a while, but there's a book by um, Tony Mitra in Canada where he, they test for glyphosate in Canada. Their equivalent of the FDA tests for glyphosate. So he went through, they test for all kinds of pesticides. So he went through their database and published a book on the residues that, um, are found, and so you can look up for Canada, products that are in Canada, what the residues are. And by the way, the, the highest uh, contamination for glyphosate is in Canadian foods, US food second, lowest in Mexico, for foods imported from Mexico. Uh, and it's also highest on non-GM, and non-GM I mentioned this before, desiccant treated crops, because of that being treated while they're growing and then you're killing it and the plant's trying to survive and it's producing more grains. And so it sucks up the glyphosate and that ends up in the, the grain, which is why pastas and you know, your wheat, your oats and so on are contaminated. So standards exist, um, but the, uh, the, the standards are really meaningless. They, 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 
they're not based on hard science. It's, it's a convenience that allows the administrators to post something. Um, let's see, there's a, I think the next slide might just give you an example of the ridiculousness. The EU allows 0 0.3 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. The United States is so it's that three and, three and a half fold greater amount. They're both, cons they're both called safe levels. They can't both be safe. This, this doesn't make any sense at all. So something, um, I mean, like if, you, if, you're, if you're testing here, like if you're testing for, for glyphosate and they come back and they say you have this level, it's useful to compare one person to another and so on, but it's not useful for having a reference to actual safe levels because we think no level is safe. To give you an idea, uh, we were to, back here we were talking about uh, what one part or certain parts per billion or whatever, parts per million. And then you have to remember, a study done in Thailand showed that one part per trillion, that concentration, this is in vitro cell cultures, would would stimulate breast cell cancers to grow. And if, to help you under visualize what is one part per trillion, that's one drop in 20 Olympic sized swimming pools. We're talking a uh, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty uh, diluted substance here that causes a lot of problems. And so keeping that in mind that one part per trillion Are we aware when we're eating or we're using like or gel for children or eating food, drinking wine and so on? Now granted, in organic products, you have a chance of getting a really low level and maybe no level. Uh, Cheerios, I'm astounded. Like I go to my, my uh, local food co-op and they sell Cheerios. They say, why on earth do you sell Cheerios? It is the most polluted in terms of glyphosate of all the, all the commercial cereals. Um, and they say, well, customers like their brands. Well, you got, you know, I don't know, I, I guess I, I'll get in trouble if I, if I go further on that. But I mean, it, you know, it, contaminates, it contaminates sterile cotton. I mean, and, and I, I use the example of, um, I mean, like right now I have, I, I was just to my dermatologist, I had some uh, pre-cancer skin uh, cancer things going on. Uh, and so I say, well, so you go to the doctor and they, it, you have to excise, say something was growing, they excise it, they patch you up, they put a sterile gauze on it, some salve and whatever. And if the sterile gauze is contaminated with a carcinogen, which glyphosate is, something's wrong with this picture. And I find that, that having tampons contaminated, having um, children's, um, clothing, cotton clothing contaminates because so much cotton produced in the United States at least is, is, uh, is GMO cotton. So that's that for, now these are all, most of these are parts per, let's see, these are all parts per, these are all parts per billion. And then this slide shows, you know, I mean, I feed my animals, animal now, only organic, um, cat food and I wouldn't feed anything else. Um, it's amazing and I, I never hear any of the vet, you hear these vets talking on, on, on the radio about uh, dog foods and this dog food and that dog food. They never talk about the contamination of pesticides, especially carcinogen. Glyphosate loves bone marrow, loving bone marrow straight out for bone cancer and other cancers. I'm very sensitive to this because I had a, my beloved English Mastiff die at six and a half years of bone cancer. And not because I fed, what, and I wasn't feeding, I wasn't feeding her glyphosate, this before I started any work on glyphosate before. So I wasn't even aware of that. But you know, I don't know she could pick it up there, she could pick it up on the street. You see, you see all the ways people treat the street side, you out, you're out walking your dog, your dog walks into the, into the, uh, the grasses to pee your poop and, and you don't know when they just sprayed, how much glyphosate they're getting on them or other pesticides. That's why we need to control the pesticides more. 
And this is really frightening to me. I mean, it did some work on us in California, the residues in vaccines. And the reason you have these residues in vaccines is because all these, for example, these, the list here is all childhood vaccines. Um, the reason is they use gelatin. And gelatin typically comes from animals that are fed GMO crops, whether it's soybeans or, or whatever. That glyphosate ends up in the gelatin that comes from that. So MMR, which is the one, one of the, um, we think is one of the stronger links to autism, has the highest amount. Now remember, parts per billion, one part per trillion stimulated breast cells. So you take a thousand times each of these numbers gives you the parts per trillion. So the basic effects of glyphosate, it interferes with bacterial production of essential aromatic amino acids. And since these are the structures of all life, I mean, basically the structural units of protein, um, it just messes up everything. I mean, whether it's an enzyme or, 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 uh, or signaling, uh, energy storage, whatever, it's, um, well, and actually it, it it significantly, I mean, it, well, I don't, eh, I'll go back here. I think I'll talk about this later, but actually because it, it, it can displace, it can replace um, one amino acid um, that we talked about earlier that then that protein is changed. And when you change a protein, whatever function, the protein in that enzyme, whatever it changed, that enzyme no longer functions as it did originally. So that's why glyphosate causes so much, uh, so many problems, a really vast number of problems. So this is just kind of a quickie on exposure. You know, you, you, you get exposed, however it is, it, it's faster if you're injecting it, of course, but mostly from dermal contact or ingestion, well, ingestion, this is an example for ingestion, goes into your intestines. So within about two hours of eating, it's in the bloodstream. And there it's gonna circulate for a couple of weeks. And then it passes into the extracellular membrane that surrounds every cell in our body. And then we go to, let me see the next slide. So of all that, the, the molecules that come into you, about 1% are taken up by cells. And then we end up with defective proteins that are excreted back out into the body. And then this is going to affect all kinds of functions of your body. So basically it, ne it negatively affects all biology uh, at, at very fundamental levels. And that's the problem. And it's inheritable. This is a problem. Those proteins that are changed can be inherited. So uh, some of the research, most recent research shows that you may not see a problem, say whatever problem is created, you may not see it in your children, but you'll see it in your grandchildren. You had the problem, your kids didn't get it, but then it pops up again in your grandchildren, your great grandchildren. And these, this slide is just to show glyphosate is linked to so many diseases, disorders, Social injustice is mentioned because if, if you're low income, that in inner city with, in, a, in a food desert, you're eating crappy food, often glyphosate inundated. Uh, if you're a farm worker, you're, using, you're being exposed in fields and your family's being exposed when you go back home. Um, so anyway, and then all these other issues that I'm mentioning here, cancer, ADHD, kills honeybees, climate change we'll get into later. Um, glyphosate is, um, serves many masters. Steve, I'm going to take a quick moment to, to jump in. Greg just posted in the chat, said, most folks in NOFA are not chemists. Is it right to say that interfering with the aromatic amino acids, tryptophan and phenylalanine, is the same thing as interfering with the shikimate pathway, i.e. the shikimate pathway is the pathway for forming said aromatic amino acids? They're all linked. But what's happening in the shikimate pathway, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a, uh, an enzymatic function, yeah. And of course, it's, it's functioning 
what is dysfunctioning there is the ability of different bacteria. I mean, for example, it, it, there's, so many, there's so many different functions. It, it, it differentially affects, negatively affects beneficial gut microbes, bacteria in particular, and helps proliferate pathogenic bacteria in your gut. So you get a gut imbalance there. I mean, talk about your gut microbiome and so on. I don't know if that helps. I can go, I can go back. Uh, I don't know how far back that was. I can I can dig into it later in more detail if you want. Is that okay? I think that sounds good. It seems like there are a couple more questions and conversation about this. So yeah, let's let's put this on the list for uh, the Q and A following. Yeah, I mean, I had a whole bunch of slides on on um, on amino acids and so on. I cut them all out because I wanted to get to some other issues. Uh, Oh, my cat's participating now. I'm sorry. I can't, can't <laughs> shut her up. Um, let's see. Oh, I know. I was going from all these different problems. And so um, this, this slide looks at uh, celiac disease and over time and the use of glyphosate on wheat. And so again, these are correlations. But we do think that a number of people with celiac disease, it may be intolerance of glyphosate. Not, not all, of course, but some of it is the intolerance of glyphosate. That's what this slide. Are you gluten intolerant? Are you glyphosate intolerant? And there are a lot of slides that I guess I go through. I don't want to spend time on this. The, there's a lot, of, a lot of data, and this all has to do with um, correlations because a lot of these studies you can't actually do uh, it would be criminal to do the studies, so you can just do correlations with looking at hospital data and uh, as best you can uh, adjust the data to look at it intelligently. This one looks at just autism. Uh, you look at where Roundup Ready Crops began, uh, then Prearvis desiccant, and then it just, the curve follows very nicely. The, the, Coefficient uh, is very high here, so I think we have to pay attention. And this is from uh, my colleague at MIT, Stephanie Seneff. Um, yeah, as she says here, if you're not concerned yet, you should be. Um, and this isn't all just due to glyphosate, but a lot of this we think is related to glyphosate because glyphosate has the ability to affect in all of these ways. And this is back earlier when we had some of this mineral imbalance stuff. This, this shows basic industrial agriculture's disruption of the mineral availability and, so, and then it relates it to disease. So these, these are kind of small on screen. You have cancer, you have obesity, asthma, and so on. And that's just pesticides, herbicides, fungicides in general, the ammonium nitrate, and so on. So, well, I don't think I'd need, I'd be preaching in the choir to say here, we don't need industrial agriculture. We need, we need um, regenerative uh, organic agriculture. So this just relates back to the, since all these are based on correlations, I mean, we have to pay attention to them. It's a valid. Uh, a few slides here on cancer. Back in 1985, the EPA said glyphosate caused cancer. Um, that's eight, 1985. Let's see. 
And then after that, the, the EPA began to um, exert behavior that I would say, to be kind, uh, not well suited for protecting the health of the environment and people and so on. So in 1981, they changed their classification to non, a non-carcinogen, 1991. Let's see, so that's here. And then in 2013, uh, Marion Copley, who worked for Jess, Jess Rowland was the guy at EPA in charge of glyphosate. And Jess, Marion, she was the chief senior scientist who worked for him and she was actually dying of, of cancer. And she sent him a memo listing all these things about all these problems that glyphosate causes, all, any of which could be a cause of cancer. And that, that the EPA should change that that uh, um, right, th that uh, category back to a probable human carcinogen. We actually have, I didn't give another slide on this, we actually have, um, we actually have um, a memo from Jess Rowland to Monsanto saying, I'm going to kill this cancer stuff and if I manage to be successful, I should get a medal. So here's the EPA telling the perp, I'm gonna save you, give me some money. Uh, so in 2015, the IARC, the International Agency on Research on Cancer said, nope, it is a probable human carcinogen, which was helpful. Let me try this again. No. Oh, this is the oh, this is the email. I'm sorry, I do do have it here. This is to Daniel Jenkins. Uh, well, he goes on and on. So basically, if I can kill this, I should get a medal. He's basically so he was trying to delay a report by the. Um, ASTDR, which is, uh, oh God, what's ASTDR stand for? Uh, it's part of the EPA. I've worked with them. Anyway, they were going to do a toxicological profile of glyphosate. And so he managed to delay it from 2015 uh, or whatever year it was. Yeah, 2015 to 2019. So all those years where it could have been helping to save people's lives and health and so on. And they still claim it is not a human carcinogen. Trump administration has been very good about Trump administration actually told, uh, I'll probably get into this later when I talk about some of the court cases. They act, during the court cases, I think it was the first court case in California, Trump administration got a hold of Monsanto and said, don't worry, we got your back. So environmental effects, once again, I'll try to get through these. Uh, once again, let me count the ways, we're not getting into a lot of detail, but biological diversity, and this is from a t-shirt I got some years ago, uh, politicians won't save it until it's popular enough to put on a t-shirt. I think that's often true, sadly. Glyphosate has fungal infection effects, well, and some other things, but it affects bees, it affects amphibians, as I showed one of those other slides. Lots of effects, and there's also some plant ecosystem threats that that um, this was done from a. I forget what year the study was, but um, it's interesting in some of the crops where there's certain fungal infections that have just bloomed under glyphosate. But like I said, like in in the gut microbiome, it favors certain pathogens and apparently does the same in some other arenas besides your gut. Now, this was one of the ones I was thinking about, aflatoxin producing fungi on corn. And aflatoxins are problematic in themselves. Uh, used around trees, it can cause a number of problems. Again, I don't need to talk about the details, but um, that big old healthy tree is not uh, immune to its effects. So glyphosate in climate, the climate crisis, I mean, big ag has lots of problems that contribute to climate crisis and glyphosate's contribution is maybe not so conspicuous, but certainly deadly. I have to get my slides in order here. 
So I don't, I mean, you know, you know about carbon storage. I don't need to go into this, but it's, it's glyphosate is lowering the nutritional uptake by plants and also reducing the carbon sequestration in the soil. Um, big problem. You think of the millions of acres that are treated um, with glyphosate in the United States, well, globally, I mean, it's just billions. It's incredible. Big contribution to the climate crisis. Um, I was lucky enough in, in, in uh, California to get to do some work with uh, Congressman Ted Lieu. Um, and this, wait, this, wait, that's some slide ahead, I think. I think I had this slide. Yeah, this slide. He arranged a congressional briefing, and I brought together a group of scientists, about a dozen people, some scientists or a couple activists, to, um, we ended up, we, we, we had half a day with the congressional staff, and we had half a day with EPA scientists. And let's see, this was our Motley crew. And that's, that was actually taken in the congressional briefing room between, between that and going to the EPA, which was a different building. Um, so that, I'm, here I'm, I'm talking about, uh, did I miss a slide? Let me go back here. I thought I had, a, oh, well, I, well, I'm talking about action, action to take. So, so that's kind of, uh, oh man, I can't, I'm having trouble navigating over here. I think I missed some of these slides. Um, this just has to do with the climate crisis. I mean, regenerative agriculture is, what, organic regenerative agriculture is what we need, of course. I mean, my mantra is healthy soil, healthy plants, healthy gut microbiome, healthy people and environment. It's that simple or that, that complicated. But so, so we have, you know, so, you know, I mean, glyphosate is a horrible chemical. There are lots of other horrible chemicals. Uh, you know, it's in everything. It's everywhere around us. It's in our food. It's in our water. It's in soil. Um, so, Borrowing from, borrowing from the late ever gracious Congressman John Lewis, and I think you would approve of my use here, make noise, get in the way, make good trouble. And that's at a local, state, and national level. So this was my first major action. As I said, I was fortunate to uh, work with Congressman Liu in California and we had this meeting with the EPA, with the Congress and the EPA. Um, well, I'm jumping ahead again. It's hard to navigate. I have to go over here to a different place. No. Okay. So this was our crew. And then, so that's, that's a national level trying to influence Congress. Congress, was, the congressional staff were interested. The EPA could have cared less. Um, uh, in fact, that's where we confronted them. We said, okay, when you're, when you're looking at the problems of glyphosate, do you ever look at it as a herbicide product. You just look at the chemical glyphosate. Oh no, we only look at the chemical. Well, if you're not looking at the product as it's, as it's being introduced into the environment and how people and animals and, and so on are exposed to it, you're not doing your job. And they just openly admitted that. And we also said, well, what about when glyphosate's used in conjunction with maybe 2,4-D or some other, oh no, we never look at any of those combination of products that might well be used at the same time or in close succession. This is, they don't test the real world. Uh, when I came back from that trip to, to uh, Washington, 
I was able to piggyback that onto something going on at the Malibu City Council and sold them on the, glyphosate. They, they wanted to get rid of, of all pesticides on Malibu owned and operated property. And I broke the, I broke the tie with my glyphosate presentation. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it penetrated them. <laughs> well, maybe having Ted Lou behind me helped a little bit too, so. So I'm just saying, it, it, you know, if you, if you can piggyback one event on another, let's do it. In fact, Ted Lou, this was uh, nine months after our, I thought I had another Ted Lou meeting. I don't see it. This is nine months after our meeting in Washington, and he did a statement, uh, a press release, where basically he was saying, um, he thinks consumers should immediately stop using all Roundup due to the risk of cancer and so on. Uh, and then he also suggested that, you know, we think uh, health and human services need to review glyphosate and maybe we should look into leaked information on Monsanto because right now at this time, some of the stuff was coming about Monsanto and EPA being in collusion. So then he went further three months after that press release saying he wants the OIG, the Office of the Inspector General, to conduct an investigation into several agency glyphosate review related matters. Uh, but nothing happened when I did the slide, it still hasn't happened. The Trump administration has blocked all of that. Um, and then in 2017, some of the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma data and documents started getting released, showing collusion between the EPA and university, well, between Monsanto and some EPA officials, some universities, journal editors, and others. And if you, if you go online to the, if you put in Monsanto papers, secret documents, or Baum Headland, B-A-U-M dash H-E-D-L-U-N-D, Monsanto, you know, there's a whole plethora of, of more documents than you can read. It's all the stuff that came out during uh, the court cases. So let's see, so we had that going on. And then we, we were fighting hard. I had written an article back in 2014 or 2015 to try to get glyphosate listed in Prop 65. Prop 65 is the California uh, uh, law that says if something causes cancer, it has to be listed on the product. So when people know they're, you, you know, you, you've seen its labels. So it says, in California, this product is considered carcinogenic or whatever. So uh, we, we managed to get that after, I mean, uh, actually Bobby Kennedy and Michael Baum of Baum Headland managed to get that on the list. But then we had that, we had a bunch of hearings because they wanted to list it at uh, a little bit over one part per trillion. Um, and we talked about one part per trillion earlier being a problem and so on. Um, So we had, we basically we had these hearings in, in Sacramento where we're saying that that risk level is totally unacceptable because one, as I mentioned, the, the lack of global standards of what's a safe level is non-monotonic. That is, it's normally you think of a, of a poison, the more poison, the more poisonous. I mean, the, the dose makes the effect well with glyphosate, it's non-linear. You can get responses at very low doses as you do with uh, other hormone disruptors and so on. Uh, it bioaccumulates, so exposures are additive. I mean, I think somebody at this hearing presented something to show that, okay, if you have 1.1 milligram of glyphosate per kilogram body weight, um, if a child, lightweight, sits down and has a bowl of Cheerios, some orange juice, uh, toast, and what else, all together, the amount of glyphosate contained would exceed that amount, you know, so it was, anyway. Um, and also they can't, they have not, as I just said about when we were DPA, they haven't assessed exposures from multiple sources. So of the same product, as well as multiple chemicals. This is all, you know, it's all, the, it's all interrelated. 
Um, and we're, we're saying glyphosate damage is at the cellular level. So any glyphosate harms any. So, and that level they had would exempt most foods, by the way. So they were, it was very convenient for the industry at least. Let's see, so I think I'm, whoops, I'm here, 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 here. Oh, so this just emphasized, you know, make noise with some activist groups too. This was after the hearing outside in Sacramento. We just, oh, there was an activist group there, Moms Across America, and we were just demonstrating to the public. Uh, it's been, Let's see, so again, make noise, get in the way. So then we thought, well, we'll try to meet with Governor Brown directly. Um, so we had a meeting with his staff. Bobby Kennedy was our spokesperson. Again, further, largely to further emphasize the need to reconsider that non-significant damage level, you know, to try to bring that, uh, that level, the, the level was too, was way too high. We can't have that much. So I think our main asks were to Governor Brown, this was the big one, immediately suspend glyphosate usage on all state owned and operated property. Uh, and then encourage the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, that's the people that run uh, Prop 65, to review independent data to contribute to their, their risk assessment. They had a very poor risk assessment. And then also, this was during the trials, so we were trying to get the judicial branch to allow more Monsanto documents to be made public. And so the bottom two, we did have some success on. So that, that, was, that was, it wasn't totally useless being there, but an interesting point, the, the uh, this again just shows the, the mixture, the collusion. Um, the Sacramento B, primary reporter for the Capitol. We had an hour, hour and a half uh, uh, news conference afterwards. Lots of notes, lots of, not one word appeared in the paper. Our guess is that Governor Brown did not want to deal with this. He simply said, you write one word, you're not going to be covering me anymore. <laughs> you know, it's pretty easy to discourage someone. But that's what happened. So let's see. Um, so then during some of the trials, or setting up for the trials, um, we had a lot of problem getting the courts to allow some of these documents that were sealed, but basically one net. And so those secret documents that I mentioned earlier are now listed in the link I show here, uh, takes you right there. And like I say, be prepared to be shocked because I can't, you can't make this stuff up. I mean, this, all, the, all the documents are there from the trial, every word, and so on. Oh, this is just uh, following that first trial for Dwayne Johnson where the court was ordered, the court, the jury ordered them to pay him $289 million. Um, of course, that all got cut back uh, I think he got cut back. He got cut back about $89 million, I think. Um, and the problem with the courts in California is they, okay, he was, his medical assessment was that he had two years to live. He's outlived that two years already, but fortunately, but they said he had two years to live. So the court says, Okay, well, we can only cover you for a future two years. If you live 10 years, too bad. You know, you have all these medical bills, millions of dollars of medical bills. I mean, Dwayne Johnson, at time, I, don't, I didn't include any slides here, just his body covered with lesions. And, you know, he can't sleep. He can't, he can't go swimming. He can't, he can't go to a public pool because he grosses people out. He can't sleep because he's in pain all the time and so on. So um, even though he's got kids and so on, um, so, well, they'll probably make buy with the 89 million. But meanwhile, uh, and the reason they won, by the way, is because Monsanto failed to warn people. 
like on, on the products being used, they did not warn them that this could cause cancer. This could be a significant problem. Um, so now, uh, at this point in time, I don't know how many cases were waiting to be tried, uh, either pre-trial pre or in litigation. I think Michael Baum has maybe, I don't know, probably as many as 1,500 cases, whatever. But this is the whole team that did it. By the way, Brent Wisner, who's pointed out there, is a exceedingly good trial lawyer. He, he, he just, in great memory. Bobby Kennedy helped and so on. But anyway, right now there are more than 125,000 cases of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma waiting to be tried. Some of them are in trial or waiting to go into trial. Bayer, which bought Monsanto, has agreed to pay out $10 billion to cover that, those cases in future. Not nearly enough. Because I mean, I talked to, I was doing some work with um, Dolores Huerta. Um, Dolores Huerta was the co-founder of the farm workers with, with Cesar Chavez. And farm workers, the farm workers who aren't reading English, don't read English, speak English, whatever, they're not, some of them are not aware of me, they're working out there, they're not aware of what's going on, they're not gonna be covered. There'll be lots of people sick, they're not gonna be covered. Lots of other people aren't gonna be covered. This is just for the United States, anyway, as far as I know. Uh, but I wanna note that Bayer did a really brilliant move in the pretrial period before Michael Baum and company had even picked the, the jurors, Bayer, Monsanto pulled the brilliant move of selling themselves to Bayer for $63 billion. That's the million with a B, that big B, right? And as of a week or so ago, the total valuation of Bayer by the stock people is only $63 billion. They got nothing from acquiring Monsanto and probably actually hurt them. I think it cut, I think it cut their value in half. Uh, so of a sort, there's a little bit of justice there that they, they're, not, they're not brimming. Uh, but you know, 63 billion for them is not a whole big deal. Uh, but there's a little bit of justice. And I'm trying to find my slide where I'm at. So coming back on another level, state level, here, here we've tried, um, well, this is in November of last year. We had four bills that we were giving testimony, four bills just dealing with glyphosate. And there were a couple other pesticides too, but for, there were four, uh, four uh, uh, glyphosate bills. Um, and I don't think any of these have made it they most of them have made it one way or the other out of out of the legislature. I mean, at least out of committee, uh, passed favorably out of committee. But I think most of them. I don't think any of them have gotten. Somebody can correct me on this if you know. I don't haven't heard that any of them got on that direct path. It's going. To, they're going to be on that path to passage. And there there are some good bills. The the most valuable bill, which uh, Carmen Gentile has shown here, proposed, was that they ban glyphosate and all glyphosate products from the state in total. And that really is the best because if you don't ban it, then it's still going to, in a total manner, if you just ban it on, from school property, you just ban it on state land, which were some of the other proposals, which are good. I mean, they're, they're helpful, but you're still going to be eating, it's still going to be in the air, it's still going to be in the water, still going to, you know. Um, so rather than put a Band-Aid on something, that bill was the most important bill. And that was changed. Um, that was changed by the chair, um, the chair of the committee, the, uh, the, uh, the chair of the House Committee, to a bill that would take glyphosate off the shelves for consumers. And that's helpful, but again, it's like a Band-Aid, because all the big uses are still going on. But he felt he could get that bill passed. Uh, for my own part, for something I could control in, in South Hadley, after 10 months, I managed to get um, a, a, a regulation formally proposed, which was then passed on March 11th and went into effect upon signage. Uh, we have several towns uh, in Massachusetts that, that have passed uh, similar bills, some of them, and I, anybody interested 
I have a whole package that I worked out with, uh, with Laura Kelly in the Cape to send anybody that helps guide you through that process to work with your board of health because boards of health have the legal authority to ban something like glyphosate if they deem, if they justify that it is a, a public health threat. I would like to see this happen in 500 and what, how many towns do we have? 533 towns or something? I'd like to see it happen in all those. You can't ban it on private property because of preemption. So preemption prevents, unlike, uh, unlike uh, Columbia County, Maryland, I think it is, uh, where they don't have preemption, they could ban it on all properties. But here in Massachusetts, we're gonna ban it on town owned, town controlled property. So let's say Killing You Slowly brought to you by, I always said by Monsanto, now it's brought to you by Bayer. So in some summary here, I have a couple more slides, but just a summary about the, the effects of glyphosate. It's uh, more toxic to humans, more toxic basically than we were led to believe. So for 40 years, they got away with it, just like the tobacco industry. That's been changed. Um, it is a key factor in a number of chronic diseases, as I reported. Um, it is a major factor in, in bee disorientation and colony collapse disorder. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to get to my slides again. I've lost my bloody cursor, just a minute. So that's then, oh wait, I'll go back one more. Um, yeah, it's, it's effects on biological systems are very complex and it works at the molecular level, starting there. I mean, that's why it's a slow, insidious effect. And um, it does play an important role in the climate crisis. Um, years of corrupt administrative and scientific activities at the EPA uh, call into question, to me, calls into question almost anything EPA says. Um, I have to know more about it from independent science. Um, it does pose an unreasonable risk of adverse health effects to humans, animals, and the environment. There is no safe level. And it shouldn't be in a food supply or water, air, vaccines. It harms us every day. And that speaks for itself, I think. I mean, it should be classified as an ecocide. Um, and it should be banned internationally. And we all need to practice regenerative, organic, or biodynamic. Uh, I use those a little bit interchangeably, agricultural methods. I realize they're not interchangeable, but so. Just a few quick slides on understanding glyphosate and managing glyphosate and other pesticides in Massachusetts. This is an example. MDAR has registered, I mean, just one example of MDAR registered, registered products. That are, all these are banned in the EU because they're just too damn awful. 2,4-D, we have 23 2,4-D products. Paraquat, an herbicide, we have five of them. Another, atrazine, a terrible herbicide, we have 13 of them. Chlorpyrifos, an insecticide, organophosphate, organophosphate insecticide. We have seven of them. Oxytetracycline, that's used in, um, that's used in uh, livestock and in aquaculture. We have three of them. Of the neonics, we have 35, Im the imidacloprated uh, neonics, which, well, ne well, we have lots of discussion about neonics and, and pollinator killing and so on. Uh, and then the acid amiprid, amiprid um, that one is banned in France, uh, but not the rest of the EU. And then although glyphosate is not banned in, in the EU, it's partially banned in some EU countries. We have 24 glyphosate products. Come back here for a second. I don't know if I missed this one or not, but this is my question in having this whole series right here is, how is it that we keep coming back to having to address health and environmental concerns for yet another potentially egregious pesticide? And I think the problem lies with the MDAR approval process. Otherwise we wouldn't have eight 
8,462 products registered right now. Every year it goes up a little bit. I mean, basically we're eating, drinking, breathing in obscure pesticide stew. I find that really offensive. And then this is the, an example of some of the products. These are just the products that I chose out of the list. And I think the problems include, like with glyphosate, their, their data, oh, that's supposed to say data review, is not kept up to date. It's, it's ancient. It uses really bad data. It, uses, it takes data from one of the chief propagandists at Monsanto. Terrible. So, and they're blindly following EPA's assessments. That's a very flawed process. And I think the government, mass government, needs to quell concerns about any gross negligence, collusion with the industry, or any kind of impropriety, um, as we've certainly with, witnessed at the property level with glyphosate. And so this is what my, my ask would be, is that <clears throat> have the OIG, just like Ted Lieu asked the uh, EPA OIG to, oh, I think another misspelling, sorry about that, to look into any potential misconduct or misunderstanding by MDAR employees, pesticide board members, or pesticide board subcommittee members with regard to glyphosate and other pesticides. I mean, I've witnessed just a few subcommittee meetings and, and I don't find that, in, at least that's a subcommittee, I don't know about the others. I don't find that all the members are very well versed in what, what's happening at these meetings. Anyway, this can best be handled through state senators and representatives. Find yours by just clicking on this uh, this website and, and you put in your address that tells you everything you need to know. So that's the end. Um, this slide, by the way, is uh, just to bring you back. If you were at the summer conference, the last summer conference, this is why well, I took this at Ap Apricot Farms, which was about 45 minutes from where I lived. Uh, and that was the subject farm in the film, The Biggest Little Farm. Great place, really great place. And I don't have time to, uh, there's a lot I can tell you about the slide, but I don't have time. So I, I'll stop. <laughs> so what do I need to do, um, Barry? Do I need to stop sharing or what do I need to do? All right, well, why don't I uh, click on the little stop sharing button for you, Stephen, and that way we'll all get uh, full screen videos of each other. And um, I know there are some people who have had a couple of, a couple of things, I, I, uh, to talk about during the uh, sure during your presentation, so I suspect that people will be able to jump right in. I would say um, so if to unmute yourself, if you just go down to the towards the lower left hand corner of the screen, if anyone is muted, there's a, a little microphone icon that says mute or unmute. Click that and uh, and let's let's fire away. I'm happy to moderate as needed, but let's just try everyone. Uh, you know, try try. Uh, listening and, and, and speaking when no one's speaking. <laughs> so with that said, who has a question? So I had a question earlier about what a graph was showing, but now that you stopped showing your, sharing your, uh, um, your desktop, I'm not sure. Uh, it will, uh, it was, it was a graph showing percentage of corn, percentage of soy, percentage of some other things. And I, I guess I was just saying, wondering, it wasn't clear from the graph what it was a percentage of. Was it percentage of, uh, I think percentage of crop, GE. Percentage, I think it was percentage of the crop that was corn, right? So I think it was GMO corn, percentage of the corn crop that's GMO and uh, Roundup Ready corn and using glyphosate on that coin, which is a massive amount of it, large percentage. Well, as you saw, you saw the, you saw the curve go up over time. Yeah, okay, that's what I thought, I, I, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I was gonna tell you, um, well, no one's asking, if you ask a question, ask, but that last slide I showed, that showed the sheep, you know, the, not the first sheep in the foreground, but the next one back, you look at it, it looked like something was coming out of it well it wasn't it wasn't having a poop <laughs> it was a breach birth was happening 
and the, the farmer, John, um, was just running over because he's realizing that the leg sticking out and he had to, he had to get in there literally and figuratively speaking uh, and help that sheep out and saved it. It did, it did, it was born not breathing and he went through all the processes which horrified me because I'd never seen that before where you take a, uh, a newborn lamb that's not breathing. He, he couldn't, he did mouth to mouth, couldn't get it to breathe, but you take it by the hind legs and do these high arcs swinging it to get the fluids out of it, to get, you know, he'd do it a couple times and finally got heartbeat, <laughs> you know, finally got some air and um, an hour later it was nursing, just everything, life was good, right? Well, Dr. Franz, I, there are a couple of, um, a couple of things that were in the chat uh, during the, uh, during your presentation that I want to bring up. One thing, most recently, uh, just after, Five o'clock. So towards the end of of your presentation, Carol had posted. I thought I heard that if water, soil, or whatever from public from private property erodes onto public property, then there are ways to ban. Forget the wording, but wanted to toss out the idea or concept per se. I don't so, they, so, so you're saying if 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 somebody sprayed, like my neighbor sprayed, and then it ran onto my organic property, which it is. I would have a, a, a recourse. Is that, is that what the, I see? I, I, that may be true because I know we just had this discussion with Nofa a, a couple of days ago about opting out of the mosquito spraying. And when you opt out, there's a certain amount of your pro, you know, for the, uh, for the arbovirus uh, spraying they're doing. When you opt out, um, it's your property plus a certain margin. I don't. I forget what that margin is. So, maybe. Yeah. I don't. I don't. That's yeah, an individual. I don't have any. Yeah. yeah. It's an individual. I don't have any figures in my head to help uh, illuminate that one. Sorry to say. Yeah. I mean. To, I mean. As far as not, my knowledge, that's a. That's a. In fact, I have an issue right now because I, I. I just saw my neighbor, who has all these little yellow signs posted only in the front of his property. And yet in, in my organic garden is right back, you know, right along his property line. Now, I don't know what he used, when he used it, um, but I have, I'm trying to grow organic. Well, everything I do here is organic and it, it's annoyed me. I just trying to figure out how to, how to address it without, you know, getting into a, a, a nasty uh, confrontation. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, Dale, I see that you are not on mute. Is there something, would you, do you have a, something you'd like to jump in and say? I was wondering about a uh, relationship between pesticides and COVID. Um, I thought that I had heard that there was an MIT researcher that was uh, talking about correlations. I wondered if Steve knew anything about that. Well, glyphosate, because it affects all tissues, um, and you're probably talking about Stephanie Senef at, at MIT. I, she did publish something. Um, so I'm just trying to think of, of glyphosate. Glyphosate contributes to so many problems. I'm trying to think of a direct lung effect. Um, but I mean, glyphosate or COVID is is a it's a respiratory disease, but also you know, enters the bloodstream and so on. So it affects, it affects everything. So I think personally, I mean, in, in, in the arbovirus issue about, about the spraying, which the governor managed to get passed, I mean, it's, the bill's better than what it started, but it's still horrible. Um, uh, and the, the synthetic pyrethrums that they use, the pyrethroids that they use do affect uh, respiration. So it's a bad thing to have during, COVID, during any time, let alone during COVID. Um, and I think this would apply to all, to me, almost all the pesticides are going to, if you're inhaling it, it's going to affect you. If you're inhaling it, not necessarily some of the other methods maybe, but uh, glyphosate just should not be on the planet.
I mean, let me say the, the people I've seen, the, the research, I mean, I have piles and piles of papers. You can link glyphosate to so many, so many problems. And, 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 and they're looking at it very carefully in a, in a direct manner, not just sideways, you know I mean? It's like glyphosate does this because it does this, it will cause this or it will contribute to this. So, I mean, but you know, we have, you saw we have 24D, we allow 24D, we allow, 24D, you know, part of Agent Orange, right? I mean, oh, that's a good product. Yeah, we, I think we need more of that. There are products now that mix 2,4-D and, and glyphosate together, or 24 glyphosate with some other, because glyphosate, I didn't mention this, glyphosate, because of its massive use, um, there's a lot of weed resistance. So weeds that years ago were just little things that you could, you know, hoe out or knock down or whatever, some of the weeds in the Midwest are like, like, yeah, this, this thing you need chainsaws to cut them down. It's, it's just, the whole thing is crazy. It's all money. It's all corporations. It's just. Uh... So is the best way to uh, get the public aware to go town by town and do the, uh, you know, get the towns to ban it on their property? I think it's a, I think it's a very good way. Um, I mean, a year ago, well, before COVID started, I mean, uh, Laura Kelly and I had these ideas of going town to town. At least I had an idea of going town to town because I had more free time. I'd go to any town to lecture for anybody to, to stop this. I mean, that's, that's how I managed here. I mean, it took me 10 months, but they finally, the Board of Health finally let me give a presentation with lots of Q and A and um but you know what helped trip it what helped trip it to be honest not it wasn't just me the director of the board of health that's not one of the commissioners but the director of the board of health saw the movie black waters you know the movie that that, that was about uh, it's about uh, teflon and all that all the pollution done in virginia or west virginia uh mark ruffalo was the director i think and starred in it and whatever very powerful film and that Combined, she said, with what I had told her, and then combined with seeing that, that tripped it. You know, it, sometimes you just need that trigger, right? So and that's why, I mean, I think we need to work at all these levels. Wherever you can, if you're giving a, 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 a testimony in, in Boston, great. If you're working in your town, um, Board of Health, great. Like, I haven't had much help. I've been to three meetings, like with Amherst. Can't penetrate yet. I mean, they, some, of, some Boards of Health are more amenable to to listening, understanding science. Uh, so, but you know, it, it pays to take the time to go, I would say, take time to go to town to town, work carefully through it, explain whatever you can explain. Um, and if I can help, I'm open. And I do have a package of materials that I know I've sent to some towns uh, Ashfield, I think, for example, uh, where, uh, so, I mean, Laura Kelly and I did most of them together, but it, it, it's everything from, you know, if you're starting at day one and you want to go visit your board health, this step one, two, three, four, five, and then right down to getting a, a, a model regulation. And it's important to get it as a regulation because like in some places where they've been, it's not a regulation and you can't enforce it. So you need to it's important to be able to enforce it. So that's why we work for the legal. In fact, in fact, the Board of Health here said, well, you want to make sure it's a regulation, not just a, uh, what, I don't know what the other ones are called, ordinance or something, I don't know. You want to make sure it's a regulation because that way it'll, it'll, it happens in real time. And whether it's glyphosate or some other product, I mean, the procedure, the basic procedure is the same, except that what I can provide you with is all the all the the backstory of glyphosate, tons of uh, publications and papers and so on. That they're all tidied up in about I don't know eight eight things I can send you the uh, anybody the uh, uh, link to where I can send them. Actually, not the link to I can send them to you. I don't think they're linked any place. I don't most of them if they're up to date or a lot of them are on up to date or not up to date on NOFA, but if anybody's interested currently, I can send the current list to make sure it's up to date. 
like when even though March 22nd, you know, we we uh, it went into effect here, but it didn't make it onto the town list of regulations because they only do that like twice a year. So in the, in the town list of regulations, it's shown. It says this will be incorporated into the reg, give it its regulation number and everything when uh, we next meet, basically. But it, it's in effect. But to me, if I pass a law and nobody knows about it, I mean, like if you can't go to the town list of regulations, it's not there. How do I know it's there? Except for the board of health, and it wasn't published or whatever. So. Um, I don't know if they're real this or not. I, after COVID, I just kept pressing them. And I think as of last week, it's listed in Michael Baum in California, in Baum Headland. He has a list of places that have banned or restricted glyphosate all over the world, all over the, all the states. And so, but he insists on having the law as it appears. So until they gave me a copy of the law as it appears, he couldn't list it, but it's listed there now too. Okay. You just got to keep going. It means it drives me nuts. Now, we, we just have a, a five minutes here, so I actually do want to move on. I'm sorry to say we have Greg who was asking about protein production earlier in the uh, earlier in the presentation. And he's and I just want to make sure that we uh, that we get to uh, to to him um, before we wrap things up at 530. Um, okay. Can, can you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I just actually wanted to say something uh, uh, to what Dale said before. First, um, if you can get hold of the most recent issue of the Weston A. Price Foundation's Wise Traditions Journal, Stephanie Seneff has an article where she talks about COVID-19 and all of the other issues that she's dealing with including uh, glyphosate, um, including 5G. Uh, now, because there's so much that we don't know about um, this COVID-19, uh, I had the impression that she was just sort of grasping at possible relationships. And uh, you have to understand that, that we're in a, um, a, still there's a very uncertain time as to what it is, but uh, that's where you, if you can get hold of a copy of, um, I guess it's the summer issue of the Wise Traditions Journal of the Western Egg Price Foundation. Did you put that in the chat? I'm sorry? Did you put that in the chat, Greg? I can, yeah, sure. Because that way um, everybody, we can all, we can all get it. Okay. So, I mean, um, I know as, Stephanie, but I haven't, I haven't checked. She did something on, on COVID a while ago but it was a little bit shaky. Uh, I'm glad to see that she's published it, published something solid. It, yeah, okay. Um, as far as the protein, I, I wasn't trying to get into a technical discussion. I think many people are aware uh, that there is a list of eight or nine amino acids that are regarded as being essential. We have to get them from the diet because we cannot produce them. Correct. Uh, saying that, as I understand it, saying that tryptophan and phenylalanine are among those essential amino acids is equivalent to saying that humans and actually all mammals do not have the shikimate pathway. Uh, I was just trying to connect the dots to make it, uh, to bring it closer to what people know, namely the essential amino acids. I'm not trying to get into a chemistry discussion. Well, there's a couple of different things going on here. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a biochemist by any means. I'm a behaviorist and, and uh, a biologist and a pathobiologist, but the the um, glyphosate affects protein. So it, it regardless of the protein, it can affect it. Um, like I say, the glyphosate gets through the 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 cell wall, changes the it changes the protein. Protein comes back out, gets incorporated into whatever it is, uh, uh, some amino acid, whichever one. Um, but it's glycine that's being affected primarily because it, it substitutes glyphosate for glycine. That's a, and glycine is probably the most abundant of the uh, amino acids. Um, and so now that you have this dysfunctional protein, it's now a dysfunctional uh, um, enzyme that 
you know, it's kind of a crapshoot of what, what that enzyme is going to do. It was a digestive enzyme before. Now it may be, yeah, maybe partially a digestive enzyme or something else. Um, get gut dysbiosis, you get lots, you know, lots of problems because an enzyme is not doing its job. Um, so I don't know. Um, and mammals don't have uh, the shikimate pathway, but because our gut has the shikimate pathway, the organisms in our gut on which we depend for our immune immunity, for for digestion, for for energy transport, whatever we affect. That's how it affects us. So for for the manufacturers to say that glyphosate doesn't affect mammals is totally false. Totally false. Does that help? Yeah. Um, okay. Um, okay. Fine. That's 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 fine. I just um, uploaded the reference. Good. Good. I have to call her up and talk to her about it. You know, she and Anthony Samson and I met. Um, from the, that original meeting uh, I had with Ted Liu in Washington. That's where I, I called them to get them involved in, in the meeting. So we've been uh, like three horsemen of the apocalypse since then, I guess. Well, on that note, <laughs> it is 5.30 and it is time for us to wrap up. Thank you so much, Dr. Franz. It's been a real pleasure to get to, uh, to listen to your informative and eye-opening and, and uh, I mean, scary, <laughs> you know, the, the, there's a lot, a lot we have, a lot we have to do here, isn't there? So I hope know. it was useful. I think I'm really sorry that somehow the slide transport failed because I know there's some slides I missed that would have helped, but yeah. I, I can't explain it. Well, we can definitely, if, um, if you are interested, we could upload some of your slides to share. Um, if that's something you're comfortable with, we can talk about that later though. But sure. you will have the video from the session available on August 12th for viewing. And um, we, I certainly hope that you all are enjoying the summer conference. Thank you so much for being involved, Dr. Franz. And thank you everyone for, uh, for being a part of this. You know, it's our trial run with a virtual conference. And, uh, and we certainly hope to have an in-person one next year, but I feel like this, I, I'm grateful for, uh, for everyone to make this a success this year. So thank you. There's a whole lot more coming up. I hope it's useful because this is my first presentation as a Zoom presentation. Yeah, it worked. <laughs> so on that note, yeah, I look forward to seeing you all again at another virtual session somewhere soon. Thank you. <laughs>